Welcome to the Mr. Universe Meets podcast in association with the Mansformation Programme. Now, the Mansformation Program is a 12-week program for men that want to level up their training, nutrition, lifestyle, and mindset so that they can live in a body that looks great, feels great, and has unstoppable energy. On this podcast, we're going to be speaking to athletes that have reached the top of their game to understand their mindset, habits and routines, and what makes them elite. I want you to take advantage of the lessons they teach and go and smash your own goals. I would love it if you guys would like, share, and subscribe, and enjoy the podcast. All right, so today I am joined by Jamie Peacock. Absolutely unbelievable to have him on my podcast. Um, the intro's going to be a little bit long for him here. We've got the former England and Great Britain rugby league captain, uh, Leeds Rhinos and, and Bradford Bulls legend, a Man of Steel winner, Super League's most decorated and most, most successful player. Thank you so much, mate, for coming on and making the time to to come down and do this podcast. Pleasure, sure. I'm looking forward to it. Let's let's see where we go, right? Yeah. Over this. <laughs> <laughs> so, like you say, it's quite surreal for me. This, you know, a Leeds Rhinos fan who watched you all the way through them, them glory days. So to have you sat opposite me after, like, say, I think we're about 13, 14 episodes in now. So this is a little bit mental for me. Um, I want to start by sharing the story about how I actually got Jamie on the the, the podcast. So we had Ian Kirk on, I think, episode uh, two or three, and. Um, you know, I asked Ian, Ian if he could speak to JP and see if he can uh, get him to come on the on the show. Um, and then I was heard nothing back, so I was sliding into his DMs and getting no response and stuff. <laughs> and I was actually going down to watch York City. We were playing down at Barnet, I remember. Um, and my dad were driving, and, and I'm flicking through Facebook as you do. And I see one of me one of my friends and one of my clients who was on the Mansformation program, Gary, um, dressed in a, a, a lederhosen uh, <laughs> on the out of this beer festival in, in Germany. And I look along the line who he's with. And there he is with Jamie Peacock. So I was like straight on the phone to him and said, mate, you've got to hook me up. Uh, and then about an hour later, I got a video from you dressed in a load of hose and agreeing to come on the podcast. So I don't know if like the moral of the story could be like, got to be relentless or, you know, you've got to be, uh, don't stop going after what you want to achieve. Or it could be just, if all else fails, just ask them when they're pissed and that'll, <laughs> uh, that'll do the job. So um, I had a great day that day. JP agreed to be on the podcast. York City won five nil away. Um, so that, that was about the peak of my year last year, I think. So uh, finally, we've managed to do it. We've managed to get you away, mate. So thank you so much, mate, for coming down. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and, and, and that kind of gives me a good starting point, really, about you know that, that little story about wh- how we got you to come on the, the, the podcast. Like from the second that I got that video and uh, I knew you would come on. You strike me as a man who keeps his word. Uh, that's um, very, very important to you. Like, how high on your values is it to be a man of your word and, and follow through uh, on what you said you would do? Yeah, so uh, first of all, you know, when I got your message, you know, I'm thinking, I'm going to get back to you, I want to get onto it. And that kind of crystallized that I thought, right, I'm doing it. I want to get on and do it. You know, I've got a lot of respect for you and, and what you've achieved it in your sport. But for me, I, it's just uh, how I is it up on my values is I'd say it's close to being number one. It is delivering on your, on your word to people. I just think uh, it's a key skill to have in life. And I just, I've learned that through sport, I suppose. But um, I, I think before I was involved in sport that it, it meant a lot to me. If I, I said I was going to do something for somebody, I'll do it. And it needs needs to be done. And I, I don't like people who are flaky and, and say they'll do something and then, then they don't do it. I mean, time to time, we've all got legitimate reasons why we can't do something. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think the vast majority of our lives, if we spent it... Um, doing what we're saying we're going to do, I think is a key to being successful. And I think it creates trust. You know, obviously you just said that then you knew I'd be on it, which creates trust, right? You're going to trust me in what I do, whether that's in life, business, wherever you want in sport. And I think the better players you play with in professional sport, they deliver on the word. If they say they're going to do something, they'll do it. So let's say, for example, you know, when you're playing rugby league, one of the, one of the things that stops you delivering on your word is, is fatigue, right? It's fatigue when, you, when you're really, really tired. You've got a lot of voices in your head saying, don't just run there, you know, just walk there, your teammate will be all right. But I thought to myself that I had a limited amount of talent in terms of rugby talent, pass the ball 30 minutes, 30 metres, but I've, I'm good at, pushing through that pain and turning up and delivering on my word for my teammates. And that's the thing I prided myself on playing the sport. Um, I prided myself on doing that for my teammates. But then 
just in life, I think it's a super skill. I think always, always doing what you say you're going to do can take you a really long, long way in, in, in life. And I think uh, the more young people understand that, that it's not a talent, that it's just a choice whether you want to do it. it and it can just help you open so many doors and build so much trust and, and create a strong network. And that's not just doing what you said to, you're going to do to other people. That's doing what you said you were going to do to yourself and keeping that promise to yourself. Yeah, it's a great point. Now, Wayne Bennett once said to me, uh, Wayne Bennett's like the, the really great Australian coach. He's, he's like the Alex Ferguson of football. And I, I was lucky enough to spend time in, in his presence. And he says, we're all the best in the world at lying to ourselves. We've all got a reason why we can't do stuff when we look in, in the mirror. And he said, the best performers don't lie to themselves. They look themselves in the eye and say, do you know what? I need to get this done or I need to get that done. They don't accept excuses. They don't accept lies from themselves. And I think it's absolutely true what you say there, that it's about delivering on work. high performances or being a champion in whatever sport. You have to deliver on your word to yourself, but also to other people. 100%, mate, 100%. So, so let's just go back to the start a little bit. Like, um, How did your journey begin into rugby league? So, um, as a five-year-old, my, one of my best mates at school was a kid called Andrew Lightfoot, and uh, he brought in a letter uh, that Stanley Rugby Club, the local club, were asking for players. That's how he did it back then, right? He got like, a letter and I don't know whether they photocopied it or what. So I took it back to my dad. My dad said yes. And the next thing you know, I'm playing at Stanley Rugby Club. Within a couple of years, my dad was coaching there as well, which I think was a great outlet for him because basically, you know, we'd play, we'd train on a Wednesday, play on a Sunday. My dad would get to, you know, coach us as, as kids and he'd get to go out and drink, sink 10 pints, you know, on a Wednesday and a Sunday. So I think it, it worked well for both of us I had an outlet which I, I loved doing and playing with my teammates and my, my dad had a thing that we had in common but also got him out of the house too he played rugby as well did he no my dad would play till 16 and then he wasn't really involved in rugby then he moved into like the family business which was making false teeth uh, and he, he just got himself involved in that so he played very little rugby at school Cool. So you 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 started at Stanley, and then you you went through their ranks. Were you ever looked at by pro clubs? Not really. Look, I I, t I was really short sighted when I was younger. Like I was I was I, I was that short sighted once I was playing in a game, and it was like a, an evening game as an eleven year old, and one of those ones you, you know the, where you got to get finished because it's a backlog and you got to play the final the following week. And I, I dived on a carry bag in front of a load of people because I thought it was a ball, you know. So that like, that's how short sighted. I was but so no one was interested in me I was around the fringes of the Leeds amateur side you know Leeds City amateur side never good enough for Yorkshire never good enough for England 16 years old no one wants to sign me but when I get to 17 years old I was a late developer you know got taller uh, as I got uh, older and bigger uh, 17 18 but also got contact lenses could see what I was actually doing like I was proper short-sighted and then 18 years old uh, some clubs started getting interested in me Wakefield got interested in me at first you know, I had a couple of trial games for them, but they just what they were offering just wasn't a might as well have been amateur. And then, obviously, got a chance to there's a documentary, so I got a chance to trial at the Bradford Bulls, um, but that didn't go so well uh, at first. Um, so I'll jump into that story if you want. About yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, yeah. like, if you've ever if you've ever listened to to, to JP speak before uh, in live in person on the podcast, you'll probably hear the the get off the bus yeah. story. But I'd love you to to share that here, mate. Yeah, because. Um, so obviously I, I got the chance to trial with the Bradford Bulls, which meant go train with the first team for the day, which is a big moment in your life, C can change your life forever. But I, I was nervous about doing it. With big challenges in life comes self-doubt. But I took the day off work and I caught the bus from where I lived in Bramley up to Bradford. Now on this bus journey, I get more and more nervous, more and more neg negative self-talk, doubt myself more and more to the point I get to my bus stop and I bottled it, I stayed on the bus. Now I stayed on the bus till... Four miles late, it's my fact, so I've got to get off at this point. So I've got off, it's 996, you know, I've no mobile phone, I'm not, who am I going to ring? Fuck, I don't know what to do. So I, I ring, I go find a pay phone, ring my dad. He's a bit pissed with me, you know, like, he, I, I seriously, he teaches me some new swear words when he speaks back to me. But he says, you get a chance the following week, you know, I, I, I'll speak to the Bulls and, I, and we'll try get another chance, which meant I had like a couple of hours, at, or not all, but on the bu bus stop, on the bus journey, self-reflecting about what was going on right now. And I've always been self-aware and I think self-awareness is a key skill. And in that period of self-reflecting, I realised, look, I've got lots of people around me who believe in me. Dad does, scouts does, coaches do. But I have to believe in myself. You know, I'm going to have to take this leap of faith and back myself. So I came up with a, a positive mantra, you know, a saying, 
time for me to get off the bus because for me and my life, I've got another chance. I had to get off this bus. Got home, spoke to my dad. He says, you know what? They'll give you one more shot. You know, I've made some up. They've got one more shot. So all week at work, I tell myself, time to get off the bus, time to go to the bus, believe in yourself, you can go do it. Follow a week, get on the bus, keep telling myself, time to get off the bus, believe in yourself, you can go do it. By doing that, I get to my bus stop and I go train with the Bradford Bulls. Now, look, it was a tough, intense training session. It's elite sport, but it was nowhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be. And I think we all know that, you know, if you're listening to this, that um, we know when we confront our biggest fears, they're nowhere near as bad as we think they're going to be. And often when we do, that's where our greatest achievements come, don't they? When we have the most amount of self-doubt, it's if we can push through it and we can accomplish or overcome that obstacle, we can achieve great things. And I learned a great lesson that day about that, which I use for the rest of my career. Anytime, uh, you know, when I play for the first team, when I play for Great Britain, every time I stepped up a level in terms of intensity in professional sport, I sank back onto that. Um, lesson that I learned and it's one I've used now when I finish playing first time you give a talk to loads of people first time you deliver a mentoring program first time you do go on a podcast you have self-doubt but you've got to get off the bus again you've got to believe in yourself absolutely mate absolutely and it was negative self-talk that kept you on that bus and, and thinking you know the worst case scenario in your head like how important was positive self-talk through your career yeah I think positive self-talk is massive I think if if you can master that voice in your head about how you actually talk to yourself. I think you go through life more successful and more fulfilled and more happy about what you're doing. And I kind of learned in my career that I, I, I realised that we, you go through lots of stuff in your career around focusing on what you're not doing well and how you can prove that. But fundamentally, you're in the team um, for, for what you're fucking good at doing. And I thought to myself, I, I'm going to work on these things. You know, I'm going to work on the things that I'm good at doing because that's what I bring to the team. I think by doing that, it allowed me to remain confident um, because you, I think in life, if you perform, if you understand your strengths, perform to your strengths, you normally have a successful performance and you should grow in confidence. You know, whatever you're doing in life, you know, whether you're at work or, or in a sports team, you get picked in your job interview for what you're good at doing. You, you, the person who's doing the job interview goes, oh, I'll, I'm, I will pick them because they're useless at doing that and they're useless at doing that. And I think the more you can understand your strengths and work to them and have positive self-talk and use positive anchors. I think, you know, in life when you stretch yourself and something goes well, use that as a positive anchor to self-talk to yourself the next time you're in. I think that talk we can have to ourselves is just key in life. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, obviously it probably felt like the worst thing in the world when you, um, you know, you were making that phone call for your dad. He was pissed off at you. You'd probably felt like you'd sell, left you let yourself down. You'd blown your chance. You were probably very angry and pissed off with yourself. But like, what if you had just got off the bus the first time, like, and not learned that lesson on day one? Like that that getting off the bus mantra and story has helped so many people over the years. That you know, essentially, what felt like the worst thing at the time potentially being the best thing to happen here because you've been able to share that story and share that positive message with so many other people. Yeah, it's a great point and it's absolutely true and, and it, it's funny how in life that I think it's uh, how we perceive our, our feelings at the time or our mistakes I think can go on to lead us to be more successful, can't they? I, I, I think uh, our choice around whether something doesn't go well and then how we react to it afterwards, I think defines us as people and, and defines how successful we are because we all have bad days, we all have things that don't go well, but it's how you react to it afterwards is, is the key. So I could have, you know, I could have got off the bus first time and things could have gone well, but I want to learn that lesson about self-belief. That that's a positive I've got out of it by not doing that anyway. But let's say that, you know, I miss that first go and then I don't do another go, miss it and blow my entire opportunity. That's me deciding to take negatives out of the situation too with it as well. And I think, you know, I, I really believe, like I'm, I'm a big fan of kind of stoicism and stoicism is a bit of that, isn't it? That things in our life are neutral. Then however we decide to perceive them are positive or negative. Uh, yeah. around that and I think the people who decide to take a positive option generally the people who are more successful in life and again that's a choice isn't it in what you do 100% mate. and like you say you've taken that what was essentially felt like a negative situation at the yeah. time and turned it into a positive and, and that's something that you've done right the way through your career uh, as well I mean let's go back to um, 99 you got dropped. You obviously time for the balls at the time, and you get dropped for the uh, grand final. You played in the lead up to it you get dropped in the grand final Um you know, obviously, like I say, I read your book in the, in the latest yeah. and it, it made you raise your game and raise your personal standards. And, and the language that you used in your book was really interesting to me. So you said, next time they would have no choice but to pick me. And, and, and that kind of really resonated with me because, you know, when I was bodybuilding, 
if I would um, lose a show, which I did a lot of that in the in the early days, my mindset was always, oh, I'm going to make sure that next time they have no choice but to give me that first place, and that would drive me on with training and and with the, you know how well I get and how hard I push myself and all the rest of it. So you know, like you say, it was really interesting to to kind of hear you say that they'll have no choice but to to, to give it to you. That sort of language that we use. I mean, like um, you know. It's other people's opinions, right? It was your coach's yeah. opinion that you weren't good enough at the time. Uh, it was the judge's opinion for me that yeah. I wasn't good enough on that day. Um, but kind of losing that victim mentality and having that ability to go, you know what, I'm going to outwork everybody um, and, and do it next time. And that's what you did in that situation. Yeah, you've, you've nailed it. It's absolutely true that. And I think, you know, again, hard, I might come through for a theme from this, but hard work's a choice, isn't it? Your hard work is a choice and hard work can make a difference in what, whatever you decide to do. And I, don't get me wrong, you know, the first three days I had that decision and went in the team, I sulked about it. You know, I'm a 21-year-old and I sulked about it. But then after three days, I thought, well, I need to do something about this. You know, sulking's not going to get me back in this team. Being being pissed off with the coach ain't going to get back in the team. But I guess, right, hard work's going to give me my best shot out of it. And I can control that, actually. I can control how hard I work. And I wanted to use my work ethic to back him into a corner, like where he'd had no choice but to pick me. And it worked for me, you know, 12 games into the following season we played in a final and I started in that final I started in that Challenge Cup final and for me that was again an example of taking a positive out of a negative situation and then that was reinforced again by getting into the team and, and going right I've got to pick you and it went through no one gets picked in sport because they feel sorry for you that, you know or think oh we didn't pick him last time we'll pick yeah. him this time for a final I got there on, on merit and, I, and hard work and it proved that's again another good life lesson for me, I think. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And it's been full of them, hasn't it, your, your career? Um, another one that where you switched like a, a negative into a positive was um, the night that you, you severed your, your hand in the bar. Yeah. Uh, another one that involved yeah. those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, you know, you were out for a while and, and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, you, you felt you let the team down, the manager down, yourself down, and all that. So, everyone that believed in you. Um, and again, it was interesting your response to that. Like, yeah, you'd fucked up, but you went on to go put extra working there was like an extra pre-season to become fitter and stronger um you know to be even better and a bigger asset to the team when you came back i think that incident you're talking about was probably the final springboard for me to one of the biggest springboards for me to get to the player i, I was because probably 2002 i was playing for great britain and i, and I was a good player you, you know but i was a british good playing for great britain you're in the top 20 in the country uh, but you won't say you won't say at that point I was going to be a, a guy who would seen as w one of the best in Super League when they when they finish. But then you know having that drunken incident and put my hand through, sp splitting my hand and ligaments all with the with the, the glass. Uh, firstly, I probably like Frank Brian Noble, the coach who looked after me, didn't like become public, and I think. I had to repair that faith in him. I really believed I had to repair that faith in him, how he, how he looked after me. And then I just felt I'd let everybody down, including myself, but the people around me. And it just gave me a fire and determination just to just get back to just working harder and harder than anybody else in, in, in the team. And, and just, um, just had a fire in my belly just to show everybody what I was capable of. And, that then became a springboard, you know, I won the Man of Steel that year off the back of being out for six weeks through a, uh, a drunken self-inflicted injury. I, I, I won the award of the best player in the competition and I think that was, uh, again, just an, another, you used a great word before then, victim, you know, I could have played a bit of victim there, not my fault, I was, you know, all that kind of stuff, but I just thought I've got to, I've got to own this, you know, it's totally my fault. <laughs> Well, and what can I do about it to make sure I'm not in the same situation again with it? That taking ownership of situations is the only real way to, to make them better. Yeah. You can blame other people all you want, but that's not going to fix anything. Yeah, but surprising though, look, there's quite a lot of people. Who, oh, it's most people's <laughs> default. Yeah, most it's default, default yeah. to go like, not my fault. You know, it wasn't me. Um, um, so, and I think just having the courage to own things in life, again, is another great life skill to have that could just take you a long way in life. We all make mistakes all the time and just to go, yeah, do you know what? Shouldn't have done that, but I need, and, and I'm, I think the key is um, not making these same mistakes twice. Then you then you're a fool, right? Yeah. I think with it. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So so going back to some early days, like who were your mentors when you 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 know or the people that you look up to? Was the um, multiple people that you took a little bit from, or was the one particular guy in that that Bulls dressing room who you thought, okay, this is the guy that I'm going to model myself on? So yeah, it's a good question. I was really lucky to be in a great environment at the Bulls, where there's a number of players who were 
probably uh, maximise their talent through strong work ethic. So you had like Jimmy Lowe's, Brian McDermott, you know, Mike Forshaw, uh, Bernard Dwyer, uh, Scott Naylor, who, who four to five senior players who just worked exceptionally hard and did more than they were asked to do and, and didn't moan about things and just got on with it and saw every obstacle as a challenge to be overcome. And I think that rubbed off on me, but I think that suited me as well. You know, it suited my mentality. Uh, so to be in and around them uh, was great. And I thought a way for me to get accepted by these is to work as hard and turn up and do the tough things in the game. So I feel fortunate that I came into an environment where I had some strong role models who led through words, but through behaviours and examples. Yeah. And um, was it just, uh, obviously, when you spent time studying them players and, and watching what they do and they're your teammates, but also opposition teammates, you, you spent a lot of time looking at what they did and trying to add bits to your game from that. And I suppose, you know, all the way through your career, was it a constant learning process? Yeah. So m I would say I probably changed the way that I probably changed, played four times in my career. I was a big believer, like growth mindset. I didn't know what they knew. That wasn't a word back when I was playing, but just learning new skills and being open-minded to it. So I probably, I learned, I was I was wide running more of a forward um, when I first started, but then um, people get used to what you're doing. Every week you've got people analysing what you do and trying to negate what you're good at. So probably around 2002, I started wanting to learn how to offload the ball. I uh, watched how, how the best in the competition do it. It's a player called Stephen Kearney. And I always think in life, if you want to replicate any skill, a good place to start is learn from the best, right? Then I, I practiced it after training and started offloading the ball. Um, then my goal was to become the fittest player in the competition, started doing extra fitness. But then at the backstage of my career, I learned um, James Graham started playing. He played opposite me and he became the best player in the competition in my position because he started passing the ball. No one had done that for like 30 years since like the days of Lee Crooks and that in the 80s. And I always think the, the most narrow-minded, easy thing for me to do backstage in my career is go, why do I need to learn this? But James Jammer became the benchmark. So I thought, watched how he did it. Asked my coach to come up training drill. Practice passing a lot after training. And I changed how I played finally at the end. So for me... Learning and adapting and acquiring new skills was an essential part of staying at the top of sport for a long time. It's something I'm still doing now, you know, you, you, you're exactly the same. I can tell whether I talk off that you're always trying to learn and acquire new stuff and I'm always up for that, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So so these players that you're around in the Bulls uh, locker room um, when you first came on board, did they help you to switch from that amateurish mentality into the pro mentality and how did you find that shift from the amateur game to the, the professional game I think um, that's a good question because I reckon we, I reckon all them players were probably still struggling a bit with that move into professionalism um, we trained hard there's no doubt about that but we parted hard as well and I think at that point there was still that transition going on with players about eating the right things about being a true professional uh, I think there was, there was not a great understanding what a true professional looked like then. I th they thought professional is just turning up and training training, training as hard as you possibly can. Training and getting paid. Yeah, yeah, and getting paid. Training till your eyes bleed and getting paid. But actually, it's a lifestyle. It's not 20 hours of training a week. It's 365 days a year, 24-7. And I think I was in that transition along with the rest of the players in that around moving away from, you know, drinking all the time at the weekends to drinking a lot less getting your diet right, making sure you do things right after the game. And that transition probably happened more towards the back, uh, so towards the beginning of my Leeds career. I would say from 2008 onwards was that big transition into being super professional, being a proper professional. I was going to ask, is it, obviously it was, you went up a level when you went to Bradford, yeah. but it went up to the next level at Leeds. Yeah, it was different at Leeds. You know, we, it was a younger generation, um, so I was probably one of the younger players at the at the Bulls, at the old school, you know, train hard, drink hard, got to the uh, Rhinos. They'd had a lot of problems with off-field incidents at that point. So it was a lot different culture, a lot quieter, a lot more sanitised. And, and I would say m more professional, but I think it, it was good adding me to the mix to it because uh, I am, so, I train super hard, but I am a bit rough and ready, you know, I can... Uh, I, I'm quite good with mixing with any group of people and, I, and I'm good at challenging and, well, I'm not saying I'm good at challenging, but I'm good at challenging the status quo and I, I think it's, I'm a bit of a moderation. So I think bringing me in with that different mindset from the Bulls, I thought was a good thing because some of their professionalism rubbed off on me, um, what they were doing in terms of drinking less and, and 
and that. But then some of what I did, you know, how you get collate team spirit rubbed off on them. So I think it was a good mix for me. And it gradually led into where, you know, towards the last five, six years of my career, I was like super professional, you know, just really looked after myself, trained super hard, trained more than anyone, but did all the right things as well with it. And I think that's what allowed me to play longer than anyone. You know, play, I, I, I'm really proud of the level of performance I attained at the backstage of my career. I don't think many, a lot, lots of players have now have played to my kind of age, 38, but they didn't, I don't think they maintained the, the high levels of performance that I had um, in the backstage of my career. Yeah. So so when you were at Bradford, like you said, there was a real, although maybe it's not so professional, it was very, very hard working, yeah. very intense work ethic. And you think kind of having that helped you to go into Leeds and set that new level of standard, or be a, a certainly somebody that helped to step that new level yeah standard. for sure I think you know it was ingrained into me you know I'd worked teach you a long way through the lessons I'd learned at the Bulls that we talked about but through the culture we had there that you need to work hard and you need to play tough and you, and, and they're mixed together you know train tough play tough together and I thought a bit of grittiness um, and a bit of mental toughness is, is probably what I brought you know there's some mentally tough and gritty players there but I think I I certainly added that to the culture I think I was brought in for a bit of that yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like I mentioned before, the, the strength condition at your KCON, and, and sometimes I think that I struggle to understand for a while while I was dealing with, like, initially with these amateur rugby league yeah. players, is that why players don't go all in on it? Because yeah. I, my background at bodybuilding, like, it was an amateur background to start yeah. with. But I still went all in on it. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't getting paid, but I wanted to be the very best. And yeah. I could never, I could never really understand why people were half assing training, not turning up training, yeah. all the rest of it. Um, <clears throat> you know, we've, we've don't get me wrong, we've changed things around there now. We've yeah. got a, a, a great culture there. Um, I genuinely believe with the fittest team in the N- yeah. NCL we have been for years. Um, and but there's still those that go way over the top of the drinking and the bad choices and stuff yeah. like that. Uh, and and they're not maximizing the full potential. Now, obviously, like you say, you like to, to have a yeah. party and a drink yeah. as well. Well, um, you know, and, and that led to things like obviously smashing your hand up, yeah. and, and like the, there's the, the Tony Yaboa tops off in the yeah. Vegas story, <laughs> and nearly getting arrested and stuff like that. Um, and it's even led to things like uh, coming on this podcast. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but but like, how did you adjust to having to become more disciplined with the drinking and party side of things through you know through your career? I just wanted to do it. You know, I enjoyed it at the time, and I think when you're younger, you're far more flexible in terms of your ability to bounce back from stuff like that. And for me, you know, it felt like I wanted to lead by example, not only on the on the pitch and in training but off the pitch as well I wanted to set high standards I uh, demanded high standards for myself and it became more of the norm to be that professional so for me I, I want to do all that you know I like I, I've like for example I, I'd eat raw broccoli for my breakfast I'd have ice bath at home I'd stretch at home I'd do all these little extra things because I knew it, it, I worked out that this could give me an edge because other people throughout the league out doing it and this is where I can get my edge over other people again so I spoke about my ability to acquire new technical skills but you can get an edge through being more self-disciplined than other people as well as through working harder so, so you spoke again you book about when you was going running on Christmas day yeah you know and into your you know the start of your pre-season for the, for the rugby and stuff like that um and, and you, you like that idea because you know, nobody, everyone else is at home having Christmas Day relaxing and you're there putting the work in. And that's, again, something that resonated with me because I would always feel that if I was doing my cardio, if I had a busy day at work and I had yeah. to do cardio for the show and I was in there sometimes at, you know, midnight, either yeah. on the Stairmaster or walking the streets, whatever, that just felt like it gave me that mental edge of uh, everyone else I'm up against is sleeping and I'm working. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that sort of, you know, there's that sort of reason that you were going out and doing that sort of thing on Christmas Day. Yeah, for twofold. Firstly, the physical benefits, right, are great because other people aren't doing it. And you're becoming fitter but then the, I think the mental edge is almost m- more powerful than the physical side of it because because of that fact that you know when you're on a pitch and you're defending your line for like that you feel like you're defending like for five minutes in a row you look at other other people or you're playing in a game and it's arm wrestle game and you look at your opposition and you know that they've not been out there you you know that they've not been pushing out and I'll know I'll get over the top of you because of that so you might have more ta- more natural talent than me but my ability to be out there running in the cold with no music on, in shorts and t-shirt, means I, I'm mentally tougher than you. So I, I want this game to keep getting tougher and tougher because at some point you're going to quit and I, I'm, I'm not going to fucking quit because I've been out there doing doing the hard yards and that's when I'll beat you. And that's when it, yeah, that's yeah. the reason. Love it, love it, mate. Yeah. 
the first week or two it was mainly just a big increase in energy. It's easy obviously getting out of bed in the morning when you're not carrying as much weight around. How to structure your life properly basically. Follow the rules, just crack on, get it done. The dietary side of things, I didn't really quite realise how much I was eating. I've lost nearly two stone from it all and I've gained quite a bit of muscle. My wife kind of making a few comments in terms of you kind of starting to get a bit of a shape. Get your meal prep done, get your work done, get your graft done. Get your sleep and back repeat. So much to focus, and I'm normally quite non focused, so it's given me somewhere to concentrate on. It's you and James, you can ask them questions whenever you want. Now I know my limits within myself and didn't realise I could push myself. Sleeping better, better attitude, better everything really. So, yeah, so when it comes to things like pre season, um, you know, most people hate pre season. You kind of love it. I loved it. I love pre season. You know, pre season's getting paid to get fit. You know, pre season's like laying the foundations why you can go on and be a champion. You know, the harder you work in pre season, the easier the season is for me. And I thought it's the greatest job in the world. I, I used to um, root. I remember I loved it even more when I got older, but when I was at the Bradford Bulls, I remember like we were running, doing eight, 400 meters, and everyone like, Lots of people were whinging about it. Not everyone. I was just thinking, fuck, you've all got it wrong here. Like, I, I, like four months ago, I was working on a building site, umping six tiles up a time for a lad of a 20 quid a day. I'm getting paid to get fit here. I'm getting paid to do the thing I absolutely love doing. You ain't got a clue. Your perspective's all, all wrong on this. And um, for me, I think that'd be a good thing to get... I know Melbourne Storm do it now, but to get young lads to go work on a building site for three months and then come back and see how much they moan about pre-season running, running up... Uh, running up hills and pushing themselves it's just it's do you doing what you love doing and and do you know what it's a the I'd rather be so gassed in training that I never let my teammates down you know that's the place where you, where you, you were on your stripes and you and you earn that ability to win games basically the fittest players always decide games because the fittest players turn up when everyone else is tired and the opportunities turn up and you think clearer you be you see opportunities that other players don't see not because you're rugby smarter than them but because they're more tired than you and that narrows your focus and you can't see what's going on and you aren't able to react to it. So for me, it was just a fundamental part. Early on in my career, I loved doing it because it gave me perspective. But later on in my career, I loved it because I knew this is the, the key part to being a champion. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to play that back on loop to all the Acorn lads now. Yeah, you can do, yeah. 100%, 100%. <laughs> so, you know... Um, when you were training, how much of the time was actually spent in the gym? Or yeah. Was it a lot of field work or were you doing a lot of gym work as well? I know Ryan has had a great training facility, the gym facility. I've been in there before and, and seen that. So Yeah, so you probably do gym um, three times a week. So in see, it's like pre-season, it'd be four to five times a week, right? Train six days a week. But then in season, you probably, if we played Friday, for example, on, on Monday and Tuesday, be every weight sessions. Uh, Monday generally or Tuesday be your biggest day so Monday you, you, you'd be in you'd do some wrestling you'd have a heavyweight session um, you'd do some uh, video review and then you'd be out on the field for an hour an hour and a half Tuesday generally be video on weights and then you look at Wednesday it'd be um, your day off and then Thursday would be weights uh, game plan and team run 30 minutes, play the game Friday, and then do a bit of recovery on the Saturday. Then in season, you know, there'll be full day. You know, sorry, pre season will be full days with it. So, um, but yeah, for me, you know, my biggest problem was probably keeping weight on. So I'd, I'd always do an extra weight session on Wednesday, you know. Uh, that'd be the biggest challenge for me, keeping keep my weight on. So yeah. I'd have to do an extra weight session on Wednesdays. Yeah. So so was when you first started out, was was the training very sport specific, or was it kind? Of, you, you must have seen a, a quite an evolution yeah. in the training. Great point. Yeah. So I reckon it was probably just lifting weights and more bodybuilding type weights when we started. But then a great guy come in, Carl Jennings at, at the Bulls. Uh, Carl Jennings came from a shot putting background, and he introduced him more of an emphasis on, on power. Um, and you know being functional weights for the sport and you saw the Bulls in 1997 the season they just blitzed everybody because they were just miles bigger than everybody else but then I think over a 10 year period it was probably too 
just lifting weights for bodybuilding set weights now it's really specific around building power and you know like metcon training yeah. so it's more specific to doing uh, what you're doing but again you know like I, I like crossfit came in and i was thinking i was doing like crossfit sessions on my own in like 2000 when it wasn't even a thing you know because i realized that you know doing some hand cleans doing a row doing a run then going lifting some weights and doing a few circuits of that it's actually like playing for me uh, so I used to try to do a bit of that early on in my career on, on my day off it would do like almost be like what you call a crossfit session now to be specific for the sport yeah yeah cool so and, and the sessions that you were with when you're in the gym you were in the gym with the team we are yeah with uh, the team going to, yeah yeah so you go in with a team you generally train um with the same person or a couple of different people and for me you know i was i was i i trained hard you know in the gym i, I saw it place to train hard i think a lot of players just train in the comfort zone um whereas i'd always be right let's just try to stick a little bit more on stick a little bit more on stick a little bit more on and it fucked me off when i see people just lift the same weights for three sets because they'd just be like well, you're, yeah. you're not trying to do anything there, are you? You're just like ticking over. Yeah. So let's go through some <laughs> some traits that make yeah. um, great players or a great leader. So, you know, how important are the following things to you? We touched it before, but taking ownership. Yeah, taking ownership is key with anything. I think as, as an individual, you need to take ownership of your own performance. Uh, again, that's a choice. You cho decide whether you do that. And then t I think that's a, that's a really good example as a leader. You know, whether you like it or not in leadership, behaviour breeds behaviour. So if you decide not to take ownership of things, then all your team will decide to do that. And it'll be a shit show because no one will take responsibility for everything. But if you put your hand up and go, do you know what? That was my fault. I made that mistake. I'm, I'm going I'm to make sure I don't do, do that again. Um, and this is what I'm going to do in a game. So I do that uh, before a game. You know, I'd be visible to the group and say, look, this is what I'm going to do today for the team. I'm going to run at him every time I get the ball. When he gets it, I'm going to whack him, right? And if I don't do that, you hold me to an account to it. And by doing that then, if, if you're taking ownership of your performance and you're putting it visibly out to the team, then everybody else needs to do the same as well with it, I think. And I think it's a key skill to have as a leader and also as, as an individual. Well, it bleeds into the next one, which was going to be leading by example, but you kind of touched on, on, on yeah, that Yeah, you've got to lead by example, haven't you? I think, you know... There's a time and a place for saying the right thing and people listen to the right thing. And, and I think as a leader, you you have to become good at what you say and picking the right time to say the right thing is a key skill as a leader. But what you do is far more important. You know, people follow what you do. Um, and people, if what you say and what you do are two very different things, then you ain't got a chance in hell of, of what you're doing. Um, so I, I think for me, leading by example was always key in sport. But I think it's the same, you know, in life. Delivering on your words, leading by example, isn't it? But deliver on my word, I, I lead by example to my kids with that. Because if I'm, whenever they ask me to do something, if I'm doing that, like 95% of the time, I think that sets a really good example to them that that's the way you got to be in life. If someone gets stuck, if they're going to ask me to do something, then I commit and do it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, side before self. Yeah, every time. Uh, you know, I think you've got to do that. I think it's a great saying. And I think you have to learn to be selfless for the team. There's things you've got to do. Sure, you've got to bring your thing to the team and have some selfishness about what you do. But there's plenty of times you've got to do selfless acts for the team you know like pushing hard on the inside um in defense for your teammate that you're doing that for your teammate right you're pushing that when you push up in support you're doing that for teammate when you're carrying the ball five meters out from your own try line and there's five blocks trying to kill you right you don't really do you're not doing that for yourself you're doing that for, for, for your teammates you know when they all want to put you in hospital you're doing that for your teammates so you've got to have lots of acts for that within the team yeah absolutely and, and like i said as a, as a leader Clarity of communication, how important is that? Yeah, it's absolutely key. I, I think, um, I just think, I, I don't think you can talk, to, I think you shouldn't talk too much as a leader. I think you need to be clear and precise with what you're saying and, and not waffle waffle too much. And you have to, um, you have to learn, learn who you're speaking to as well, I think, as well as important. You know, people respond differently to different types of verbal communications. Some lads, as you know, need an arm around him and say, look, you're doing well. It's somebody poking with a stick and saying, you're fucking better than that. Yeah. Show us how you're better than that. So I think, you know, your verbal communication is based on who you're talking to. And I think around, you know, listening as well. So, so the last one I've got on that list is, is desire. And it's the first thing that actually, uh, Josh, who's the manager of the ACORN, is the first, before a game, we have a team meeting, that's the yeah. first thing that he writes on that board is desire. 
how important is that? Yeah, it's huge. You know, your, your will and your why to do things are just massive. You've got to have... Desire is based around what, why you want to do something, isn't it? And I think you've got to look around what's your why to create a strong desire to do something. So, you know, we were speaking before that you, your uh, desire to become or the reason why you want to become Mr. Universe, you had a massive why behind it, so it became your desire, didn't it? It's why you why you thought you were put on the planet, really, to yeah, do it, yeah, right? Yeah, understand. So that's why you attained it, and I think understanding why you want to do things thing leads to strong, strong desire. And you can change your why all the time, I think. You know, for me, as you, to play 553 games, to play excellent in each game, hard work, and some games you aren't motivated for, so... My why and then, my desire to play well, would I pick an argument with another player from the other team and my, my desire to make sure I have a better game than them would allow me to play well for the team. So I think you've got to be smart around that as well. Yeah, yeah. No, brilliant, mate. So, so you won um, nine Super League Grand Finals, uh, four Challenge Cups, four World Club Challenges. Um, you know, not bad for someone that didn't show any signs of becoming a, yeah. a professional, <laughs> uh, you know, in the late teenage years. Um, which one of them meant the most to you? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, oh God, it's really hard to pinpoint one. And I think every good thing is every grand final you win has a different people story leaning into it, and a different reason why you you motivate to win. So, for example, the Bradford Bulls first one, everyone everyone was calling us chokers, saying we couldn't win the game. You know, we'd not won a grand final. Uh, we'd won a Challenge Cup, but we couldn't win a grand final. And we had that choker's reputation. So that motivated us. We'd come out and blitz Wigan. 2003, we were winning it to win the treble. Uh, 2005 was my last game at the Bulls. So you can see just in those three, there's some clearly different motivators to, to doing it. So they give you all a different sense of satisfaction. The the thing, you know, would stand out to me is the 2015, you know, winning the grand final at, at the end. Like to win the treble, to finish your career with your own town club, winning the treble under lots of adverse circumstances. You know, we probably had six of our key players out in the in the last game against the grand final. Won the um league leaders by an head breadth, you know, Ryan all scoring in injury time. And then to win the Challenge Cup, it just was a hell of a... It was 11 months of effort and hard work from a, a great group of people and to finish in that way, to sign off your career, that that's the best one, I think. If I'm really pushed for it, and I, I'm not sitting on the fence, so I'll give that as an answer. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so obviously you left it on a, on a high there, 2015, winning that one, and that meant a lot to you. But, like, how much notice do you take of the individual accolades that you get, you know, from anything from Man of the Match to Man of Steel? Were you ever concerned with them or was it genuinely all about team results? Yeah, you're not concerned with them. They're a byproduct of being in a good team, I think. And, you know, if you're trying to drive yourself to be excellent all the time, um, that's a great motivator, I think. And I think if you're trying to push yourself to be the best you can be, then generally um, individual accolades will come as a, as a... They're not the goal, but they become part of it from through the process that you're going through so for me it's great to get that recognition but it's not what I'm motivated for I was motivated for be the best teammate I could be the best leader I could be the best rugby player I could and then by doing that anything else that happens is just a benefit off the back of it and they're, they're like they're nice to get but they're, 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 they're not we've got to get these you know so for me they're just a, they're a nice kind of byproduct of Absolutely. trying to be the best so I mean, obviously, list your list of honours include being captain of England, captain of Great Britain. Um, but you you retired from international rugby about 2012. Um, you went on to have, as we spoke about before, fantastic seasons 13, 14, and 15. Um, did did that have a factor? That extra rest that you're getting, obviously, it's tough on the body uh, coming towards the end of your career. Did did that factor of, of stepping down from England um, be one of the reasons why you managed to play so well at the back end of your career? Yeah, it was huge, you know. And, and really, as a player, you shouldn't have been put in that position. So, because of the way that the season is so long in professional rugby league, is that if you're playing at nationals, then you end up with you get like a uh, four weeks off. Then you have four week pre-season to get your body into shape for the next season where everybody else has got a 12-week pre-season with the best will in the world you can't change who you are in four weeks it's just maintenance so for 12 seasons uh, like I played for England in 2000 retired in 2012 all the way through that I had a four-week pre-season right and that got to the point in 2012 where I thought I can't I need I need 12 weeks to get as fit as I possibly can I'm getting older and I need to bank that 
So I retired from England because I no longer thought I was one of the top five players anymore. And I think as a captain, you should be in that kind of top five of players. But then I also, part of me was like, I need this pre-season, right? So I had this big pre-season, 2012, uh, 12 weeks, came out 2013, blitzed it. And I got asked by Steve McNamara to come and play for England in the World Cup, you know, be part of the squad. And every part of me wanted to do it, right? But realistically, I knew that if I did it, then it meant a four-week pre-season again. And 2014, my body was at that age that I, I needed that 12-week pre-season. So because of the logistics of a Super League season, I generally missed out on playing in a World Cup. I had to make the decision to do the right thing by my team and the Rhinos that I signed for rather than playing a World Cup. And it's a, it is a big regret of mine. It's probably my only regret in my career that I didn't play in that 2013 World Cup um, for me. And I think as a player, you shouldn't be put in that position because of how long the season is. But I answer you, it's a long-winded way of answering your question that I needed that pre-season. I needed that 12 weeks because I thought in 12 weeks, I know how hard I train, right? So I train hard in four weeks. In 12 weeks, it's going to make a huge difference to me. And it, and it did do in the back three seasons of my career. I was going to say, did you actually take that, that extra rest from rugby as rest or was it time spent in the gym and, and get it a mixture? Yeah, you had to, you had to, you had to uh, tick over because you knew if you took six weeks off and then had a four-week pre-season, you'd be so far behind everyone else. So basically it was 10 days off and then train on your own three days a week just so you didn't really even have a proper rest. But there, because I had a 12-week pre-season, I actually had four weeks where I did nothing and I came back and was so ready to train, you know, and I had that time to get fit and get match ready to play and make a difference in my size my shape my fitness it's such a physical sport as well like you know like I said, as you get in, into your mid late 30s that you know that that pounding you can't keep taking that all nah. the time without any sort of rest yeah you can't and that that you know the 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 physicality of the game forced me to retire you know 2015 i reckon the last 10 weeks i was really not enjoying playing because of the um because of the how long it took me to recover from a game. So we'd play Friday and by Thursday, I'd still be sore. And then I'd play, I'd play in a game on Friday and I reckon I'd be 75%, you know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be recovered. And just that process of just being sore all the time and not being able to train as hard as I want, just thought this, this is too, too, you know, I can't, I'm, it's too mentally, I would mentally could get myself up for things and put myself in a place to play well mentally. But Physically, it was taking its toll on me. Yeah, yeah. It was becoming miserable. So what, what did you do for recovery? Um, you know, obviously, do you have a, a set sort of like routine around sleep to make sure you maximise sleep? Did you, do, did you do the cold water, the ice baths, that sort of thing? Yeah. What were you doing? So you ice bath straight after the game, you know, for that. And then it was, you know, around then we were probably still not getting enough sleep in 2015 so you come in and train the next day but I know now the lads don't train the next day so they can try and get a good night's sleep because you can imagine when you finish playing full of caffeine full of adrenaline you're not getting to sleep just after you finish playing it's like five six in the morning so you need that sleep to recover and then for me it'd be a case at that point I'd ice bath every night stretch every night trying to get myself in the right possible shape right fluids right food by doing that um right levels of training and movement Saturday and Sunday, I generally get myself to a place where I could play again on, on a Friday. But I think recovery, certainly around sleep, um, is huge. And also your diet and then making sure you don't, it's active recovery, you know, laying in bed for two days isn't going to help you recover, right? But getting out, walking, moving, bit of a sweat, it's going to make you do it. And you touched there on nutrition. Like, what did your nutrition look like when you were playing? So, yeah, my nutrition was, we, had, we changed. So, I reckon in 2008, it was still all around lots of carbs and stuff. But we came back from that World Cup and Australia taking a giant leap forward in terms of sports science. <laughs> And the, the governing body, they did a review, which was great into it, realised we needed to change. And that's when GPS came into it, heart rate monitors, and also how you look after your diet. And it moved far much away from stodgy carbohydrates to more based around ripe protein, ripe vegetables, and bits of uh, carbohydrates in there like sweet potato and brown rice. Not, not fucking Jaffa cakes. <laughs> Jaffa cakes and white pasta, you know, and we, yeah. that move was away from it. So around then for me, it'd be around making sure I ate the right thing, try to keep my fat weight in it as low as I possibly could manage it, don't carry any excess weight and just be a good pro, really good pro. So, uh, and is that still how your nutrition looks like now? Because you're obviously still super active now. Like, say, if you follow Jamie on Instagram, you're going to see him hiking up mountains and, and you know, going on runs all the time and stuff like that. So you, you're still very active now. So is your nutrition is still the same sort of 
as it was when it was training or yeah or yeah playing, sorry. yeah i'm pretty much the same right um i i you know I'm, i i so what my diet then I, i'm a big believer in, in trying to get variety in what we eat i think we just eat too many of the same things and i don't i'm a big believer now in like uh you know biodiversity within our gut and that, that's something that's key for me so i really um watch what I eat. I try to stay away from processed food. And then um, my breakfast is important to me. I try and mix my breakfast up a lot. I have lots of different breakfasts throughout the week because I think that's a good way of getting off to a good start today. Drink a lot of water. Um, I always have like two pints of water when I wake up in the morning, one with a, an hydration tablet. Then I take supplements. I you know, take cod liver oil. I take magnesium. Magnesium's just been great for me in terms of stopping me getting migraines. You won't... So I'll take magnesium three in it and and I reckon it's the same one I use. Yeah. Yeah. Like and, quality, yeah. and it stopped me getting migraines. You, you know, it's just been unbelievable. Um and then I also I take uh I take a couple of other like supplements around anti aging like N NMN. Um so I take those. I have my I have my breakfast, which can be it's always a mix between I have like Greek yogurt and fruit and nuts, or I like I have sardines on toast. I know people don't like that, or I'll have um, porridge, or or then I'll have eggs, um, poached eggs, or then I'll have like rye vitas and avocado and salmon. So I try and alternate between them five. Uh, between it, then lunch. I try and uh, I try and eat like less meat on my lunch. I try and have a bit of beans, you know, like beans and corn around it, and then I have a meal on the night time. Then my only thing is I like to have a little treat on the night time for for because I'm not a professional athlete anymore yeah, yeah, with it. And then um, and yeah. it's not like you're not in you're not yeah. being, uh, you know inactive. You're, yeah. you're getting up in the morning and going out for that run anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then I do watch what I eat, and they're, they're my kind of principles around it stay away from processed food drink a lot of water try a lot of variety in my fruit and veg and, and what i eat and that kind of kind of works well for me and right and i know this is probably swearing to you but for me there's nothing wrong with being hungry like as a professional athlete trying to keep on weight if i got hungry i was like i've got to eat i need to eat something whereas now i'm all right if i'm hungry i've got i, I learned to deal with being hungry a bit more because yeah. i just think it, it just gives you uh well, I just think it's better for me as I've got older to be a bit more hungry. Yeah, yeah. No, it makes sense, it makes sense. So talk about like the um, the dynamics of a great team. You're part of the Bradford Bulls, you're part of the Leeds, two great teams, two great areas. Um, what's the secret of a winning team? Oh, I mean, what, what's the I think it's just having a group of people who are, who are all uh, self-aware, uh, bought into the purpose, and who are, who are hardworking and committed to the group. And it's got to be a diverse group. You know, it's got to be a group where not everyone thinks the same. And I, and I think one of the key, when I think back about my career, my uh, there was such a diverse group at the Bradford Bulls. There was just players from all over the place, all different personalities. But we all came together under the banner of working hard for each other and delivering on our word. Same at the Rhinos, really diverse group of players, different mix of personalities. Um, you know, all different spectrums, all people on spectrums as well, probably. Um, we... Um, we just came together, worked hard uh, for a common goal and was selfless about it and self-aware about how you needed to improve. So there, there are a few things in and around it. And having a, a level of trust between that team is, is huge. Yeah, well, if you deliver on your word to each other, you create trust, don't you? And, and that, that's key in, in the group. We, we started on that at the beginning. And I think in the best teams, most players deliver on the word to each other what they're going to do. And that creates an innate amount of trust. That trust is, is absolutely paramount to being a successful team. Do I trust my teammate? You know, Is he going to show up for me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I had uh, Ian Kirk on, he talked about like um, keeping the standards high amongst each other, and how you would really enforce those high standards uh, amongst people. Um, you know, and, and and not allowing people to settle for being you know mediocre or average. Yeah, look, look. Um, I, the thing is, I, some of the lads said to me, you know, um, there's a, there's a George Bernard Shaw quote about being the unreasonable man. So the reasonable man adapts himself to the world but the unreasonable man 
tries to adapt the world to himself, right? And I say, you know, I'm a bit the unreasonable man by how I, uh, people think I'm that, but I always say, I'm telling you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear, right? And that's the difference. You, you need to hear this. And you might not like it, but I'm only doing it because I actually like you. If I didn't like you, I won't say anything to you because I'd let you go away with your shit standards and be who you are. But I want you to be better at better uh, as a person and improving what you're doing. So yeah, look, I had a reputation for shooting from the hip and saying the truth and saying what needed to be said but I'd be comfortable with that being said back to me you know I might get pissed off with it at first but I come back and say you know what you're right I, I need to improve myself as a, as a person so I think you need a person in the group to hold, hold people accountable um, and del deliver some hard truths and have honest conversations with people and I, I won't shy away from doing that yeah so in, in the lead runners you had a perfect combination of leaders in, in you and Sinfield I'm sure there was others but fans would kind of view you two as the the main voices in the room would that be right yeah look there were, the, the first of all there were plenty of great great leaders within that team you know you only have to look at like Rob Burrows uh, Danny Maguire uh, Kelly Lewis, Jamie Jones Keith Senior uh, was a big influence in there as well Danny Baderas you know ex-Australian captain um, we had some great leaders in there and with the group underneath who were great as well like a, a Brett Delaney or a Disco um, but myself and Kev you know I think we really complemented each other and I think it helps that we're both self-aware we, we both um, don't care who, who gets the credit and I think our personality types are, are uh, we're not the same as each other Kev's really detail orientated uh, very methodical in what he's done super super professional got great high standards whereas I'm a bit fire and brimstone you know and I, 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 I've driven myself to be self-disciplined and not have high standards uh, but I, I'm quite comfortable rolling with the flow of things and I've got good at connecting with people I think and I think the, the two of us together was uh, a good force behind the side. I think we complemented each other really well. He was a great leader at work alongside. And what's so good now is that the, the general world is seeing all the great things we saw about Kev, you know, that great resilience, dedication, commitment. And one thing I think Kev's improved our sight in the last 10 years is his ability to connect with people and be, be real and be more human. And I think you're seeing that side of him now. And Kev gives a shit as well. He wants to make a difference, which is huge. Yeah, he's an unbelievable human being. Yeah, he is. Doing yeah. Moment. It's, uh, it's amazing to watch. So, and I always like to say you had a, multiple leaders through that team. Um, and, and like you say, you always look like a team. And it's a little bit on, on a tangent here, but I always notice one thing. At half time, you get together and you run off together. Like some teams just stroll off. Is, was that just to give a, a mental edge that we're still fit, we're still, we're not tired? What, what was that about? I think Tony Smith brought that in when he was there, like a psychological edge rather than drab up go off in, you know, dribs and drabs. You go off as a group, you're a team. So you go on as a team, so come off as a team together. And I think it does send a psychological edge. I remember 2007 in the grand final, we were playing against Saints and we, we were massive underdogs against Saints. Remember the year before, they just won the treble, you know, probably one of the best teams that played in Super League of all time. And no one backed us to win that game. And we went in at half time, and I think it was two points in the game. And we were all running off together. And they were coming off in dribs and drabs. And I said to the lads, look at these. We've got these. We're, I'm telling them what, we're, we're going to get these in the second half, you know, to everybody here. Everyone agreed. We're in the dressing room. And we went out with 33 points to six winner in the second half. You know, just that coming in together gives you a chance to talk together. But you've got that shared sense of being united together and, and achieving something together. Brilliant, yeah, fantastic. And then we spoke briefly before about the the 2015 season. That was your final season, that fairy tale ending. Um, when did you know it was time to call it a day yeah I think at the beginning of the 2015 season I was doing pre-season and it was tough really tough you know I, I was the thing I loved doing I began to hate it and I thought that's the version of hell in it that if what you love doing you begin to hate doing it and I thought it's time it's time for me you know I've had I've had a great career um and it's time it's really taking its toll mentally me to keep the high standards that I've got because physically uh, it's just too much for me, so I, I thought it's time. And then ten matches out from the game, uh, ten matches out from the end of the season, totally knew it was the right, right decision for it. And then, yeah, I remember about three matches out from the grand final, me and Mac were having a chat in the dressing room. I say, Mac, I'm, Mac, I'm hating this. This is killing me. You know, like the thing I love doing, I absolutely detest at the moment. And he got good words. He says, Look, you've got three more games. Stand up for three more games. 
I thought, do you know what? It's right. Let's let's do this. Deal with your own little first world problem of uh, being sore and start being, start start ripping in. So so like you obviously you won the treble that year. Yeah. Um and and you went on to win the the Challenge Cup uh, that that year. Obviously the same that you'd done in 2014. But following that game, you went on a bit of a losing streak, like three game losing streak. I think it yeah. was like. How do you mentally, and you've done that in 2014 as yeah. well, so like, how do you mentally get over a, a, as a team when you're on a losing streak? You've just got to work on what you're doing well. You've got to stick with the process, keep working hard, stay optimistic, but be realistic about your optimism. Don't be an American cheerleader, you know, ooh, everything's great, it's not, right? But there's some things you're doing well, get hold of them, look at the things you need to improve on, work on them, and work hard and stay together as a group and start, don't start pointing the fingers at other people, stay tight as a group. And I think if you stay tight as a group, be optimistic, focus on the things you're doing well, improve the things you're not and work hard, you, you get out of any rut that you're in at the moment. They can keep it simple like that. But the key is to stay tight, uh, circle the wagons, don't start pointing the fingers at others, don't listen to what others are saying about you as well or use it as motivation. Brilliant, yeah. So, uh, I mean, going back to that 2015 season, it looked like the, the, the treble was gone in that last <laughs> game in Huddersfield, against Huddersfield, and like, um, you know, in the uh, the As Good As It Gets documentary uh, that you did, you know, Ryan Hall says there, you know, JP just pushed pushed the full team through it. Um, like, take me back to that game. So, like, Kev kicks the, the, the two points and draws the game. I think the helicopter sets off to Wigan with the, with the shield and stuff like that. And then Maguire clips it through yeah. and, and all, I mean, I still get goosebumps watching that. I've watched this a few times in Leeds interview you get goosebumps watching him run down that that wing yeah I mean it was incredible like you know first of all I was blase I, and it was a really challenging kick to draw the game and I just walked back to receive the kick off you know and Kev just that much trust in Kev you know we spoke about trust that he could do his job kick the goal then we um, we get back for the kick off and I'm thinking we've just got to move the ball around I know shift the ball around keep them moving We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we've got a chance from my experience of what's going in my brain that we, we've got a chance of creating a gap Callum's there Ryan Hall we'll, we'll do it but then Maxi chips and I was thinking what the fucking hell are you doing but then I saw what was happening and I started sprinting after it and then it was just an amazing feeling like I reckon they reckon that about 10 of the lads probably me included did the fastest GPS run they'd done in the game they did the fastest sprint running in to celebrate with Ryan Hall on the GPS monitors that's how much it meant to everybody yeah. so it was just it was unbelievable it I mean, was like surreal you said, even, even when I watch it back on, on replays now I get goosebumps watching yeah. them do it because it's just like one of them um, I suppose like the Roy of the Rover moments in football yeah. you know, you get football you get in rugby it was just surreal like what a way to, if you're going to win what a way to win yeah and just fairy tale you know yeah. like everyone had written us off three lost games didn't think we were going to finish top of the league helicopter was landing in, in Wigan yeah. and then bang we do it you know never write us off we uh, sort of team of champions do they always think they can win yeah so that, that meant the your, your, your final game um, at Headingley yeah uh, St. Helens um, and you got KO'd by a James Roby elbow yeah. in, in that game um, and the doctor had to take you off for checks and stuff like that but there was no way you were not going to come back on yeah I mean look, 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 so, look first of all James Roby's not a dirty player he did it by accident right he's not a type of player but then yeah I got knocked out and then I was, I was getting up when you get knocked out it's funny in rugby because sometimes you wake up and you think why am I here and I did then I thought why am I here then I thought you're playing rugby, that's what you do, get up. And then I fell over and I could hear all the Saints fans cheering that have been knocked out and fell over. So I'm trying to get back in the line. And then I'm compass mentors, you know, I'm, I've been been buzzed, but I'm, I'm, I've been out, but I'm, 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 I've am I'm got a gist of what we're doing. So then the, the protocols for concussion pretty get everybody in then, you know, it's not like it used to be, you just stay on the pitch and do what you want. So the doctor brought me in and you got, you do a series of, uh, um, test before the season and then you, you do the test again and see the difference can you go back on and before we did the test I just said to the doc I said look there's two things going to happen here doc is that firstly we're going to do the test and the second thing is regardless of the result you're going to pass me and I'm going back out there to play he said, have you understood that and he looked at me and I said have you understood that and he said yeah so I passed the test and then uh, started playing again I won't miss in my uh, uh, last game at Edinley you know I was ever going to play in and you know I'm while we're on concussion I'm um, fully okay with what happened to me I, I knew what I signed up for doing playing playing rugby league there's some great concussion protocols in now and you know if I happen to get 
early onset dementia, then that's the price I paid with it. I'd not recommend other people to do that, but I'm comfortable with that. I won't, I won't sue the, the governing body. I just think uh, the changes there, are, they're getting in the right state. And I think as a rugby league player, you know what you're getting involved in. When you step in a boxing ring, you know you're going to get punched in the face. So in rugby league, you've got to take a level of responsibility with it. You've got to stop people doing daft things, which I think the game has got really good at with how long with the concussion protocols and making it as safe as it can possibly be without sanitising in the spot yeah of course mate yeah and, and obviously you went back out there you, you, you finished the game you won the game and you're walking around the pitch with Kev and Kylie what was the emotion yeah like? it was just epic you know how many people stayed behind the pitch just to cheer at us and cheer us on and just the feeling like uh, of love and emotion and, and respect was just huge you just they're the moments that you just savour and remember f throughout the rest of your lives just just felt as one with everybody in, in the crowd then it's just they're just lucky lucky person to have those kind yeah. of moments and then obviously went to the grand final um you were you were uh, trailing at one point and you managed to pull it back 22 20 uh 25 minutes to go i believe it was and you know you were under the cosh for a lot of that game <laughs> yeah that's a well, lot about the team spirit yeah all, all about team spirit i mean we, we were flying in on fumes there uh, as, a, as a group played how many what 36 games we'd had the emotional eye of winning um Challenge Cup final, three emotional law of losing three games and winning the playoff games. As a team you spent, you've got five or six of your key players out. You're, you're, you're deep into a grand final, winning by two points against a great team. And the team just held on, held on, held on. We did everything you could do to close out a game. All that thousands of thousands of game smarts that we had, we used that. And you needed that experience, but you just needed some grit and some resolve and some mental toughness with it. And we just were, we won't won't be broken. And it was a dream, like 20 minutes to play in it. If I was just, just a good way to finish my career in it, like a gritty, backs to the wall, you know, looking at each other, standing shoulder to shoulder, can we do this? Yeah, we've got it. We can do this. And that final whistle came and there's the embrace for you and Kev. Yeah, uh, What were the emotional goes that going through there? Was it like relief or joy or sadness because it was all over or just exhaustion? Yeah, what just was... exhaustion and just like, we, we fucking did it, you know, like we did it against all the odds. We've done it, you know, we you start the year with all the best intentions. You start pre-season in November, um, you know, knowing it's a long journey ahead of you and you want to win the treble and you want to bow in the best possible way. But then to go out and do all of them, just feel lucky, you know, really, really, really privileged. You feel, I felt privileged to be there. I thought this is just savour this because you, you, hardly anybody gets to feel the kind of emotions you're getting now. So just, just, in, just to savour it and be with the people that you were with, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, back in the day, you had a little stint in charge of Stanley as a 22-year-old. Yeah. You never fancy becoming a, a coach after your career ended? No, nah, not a coach for me. You know, you know what? I, I've, been, I've really dedicated to my profession. You know, I know we spoke about having a few beers, but I thought about my career all the time and I was 24-7 around it and I wanted my weekends back and I just I just think like coaching is it's just such an intense uh career to develop and the problem is in this country there's three or four good jobs if you don't get one of those you're probably not working with the players that you want to play with and then also it's you know to be a career coach is very few and far managed to do that so for me I thought I had a lot more to give outside rugby than inside rugby so I chose that other path where I thought which worked out which has worked out well for me in the end. yeah so obviously now you're doing a lot of like motivational speaking and the mentorship programs and stuff um and that makes total sense for you to help grow teams and leaders with your experience. Uh, is that always something that you planned on doing or how did that come about? No, no. I th you know, you never think about these things and I think you meet people who are catalysts in your life and I met Damien Hughes 2008 on the England World Cup tour was a sports psychologist and during that he said, do you know what? I think you've got a bit of a story to tell. I've watched how you operate and there's some things that you do. I'll help you, ex ex uh, you know, refine that and I'll get you a talk. So he helped me refine that, pulled out a couple of stories, did a talk, Talk. and then I began to build on that and begin get do it more and more often and work out more and more reasons why I was successful and then it was always a case of just about trying to improve that all the time apply, apply that principle of trying to deliver excellence and I just kept working and working on it and then moved from motivational talks developed that into a mentorship program and coaching program off the back of that which you know I love doing it you're, you're doing the same it's not better than seeing yeah. people develop is Fantastic, it you know, yeah. I had a great call with someone today who jumped on the program you know, this guy was successful, but just wasn't probably fulfilled in what he was doing. Just through 
five sessions, it's just really come off the phone call. Last, our last chat together, 50 days, and he's just flying. He's just really happy, doing the things he wants to do, leading how he wants, doing the right things by his family. And it was just such a great call to have. You know, I get as much pleasure out of that as, you know, winning, winning a game, I reckon, now. Yeah, brilliant, mate. So uh, I've got a pull a little quote out of your, your book again and it, like when you was in the 2000 World Cup uh, you had to speak about the, the best experience and the worst experience you had and your answer was one challenge cup left out grand final like you hated the public speaking yeah, and I found did, it yeah. embarrassing and, and yeah. you know, now you're doing it for a living so like have you got any tips for people um, that want to get better at stuff like that like a lot of people they care too much about what other people think um, and, and lack confidence like how have you you know, got over these sort of things? That's a really good question. So, I mean, for me, yeah, I was terrible. I was absolutely terrible at doing it. Didn't want to do it. was nervous about doing it. But I think the more you become a leader in the team, you get to learn to speak all the time and you've got to get your point across. So for me, I think public speaking is, I think you've got to prepare well for what you're doing. Um, I, I, I think you, you have to put that work in and I've practiced it a couple of times. And I think you just, then when you do it, you, you've not got to care what people think about it. You've got to know you put the hard work in. You've got to find your style about doing it. And I think a thing that worked for me when I'm doing a presentation is tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them it and then tell them what you've already told them. And I think to segue things like that. And then I, I like to, you know, tell a story, show a picture and have a, a quote with it because I think that covers all things because people learn through visual reading and speaking and that's the best way to get you, your point across and just try not to speak too fast me and you both speak a bit faster yeah. don't we? <laughs> try and slow yourself yeah, down yeah. is key for me i was trying to slow down what i'm trying to say yeah brilliant mate so so now let's say you've got the the mentorship program which is building champions uh you've got the be a champion 30 day yeah. challenge uh the well-being program that you do uh i was i'll say i ordered that myself to have a little look at it and it covers a lot of things such as like positive mindset um getting the right sleep eating right uh, exercise all this sort of stuff um and it's a it's a mixture of tasks and journaling and and all this sort of stuff again with the idea of becoming a better version of you and raising self-awareness and that's a, quite a nice place for people to start if they've kind of yeah. been doing anything like that yeah of course yeah and i think well-being is about simple stuff isn't it we were speaking before about sleeping patterns and it's about simple well-being right it's not about four hours of yoga and, and only even green organic food it's about creating some small change in your life that's sustainable that makes a difference to how you feel about yourself and the areas that you can do that in are your mindset are sleeping well eating well and being physically active and what i wanted to do was create a program that anybody could do a 10 year old to an 100 year old and i'm a big believer in life keep things simple if you keep it simple people can do it make it accessible and i think just the compound effect of doing small things consistently is what champions are all about you are a, we are a product today of the day-to-day -day decisions you've made over the last 30 days, six months, year, 45 years, aren't we? You know, that's who we are today. Um, so, yeah. Brilliant, mate, brilliant. So what's next for, for, for JP? Like, you're obviously a super busy guy. Um, we've, like, so you've got the mentorship and stuff like this. You've also been doing some presenting. Uh, we watched you on the, the, the BBC for the Rugby League World Cup and stuff like that. Are you still doing all that sort yeah, of stuff? Yeah, like, for me, I, I, again, we spoke off, uh, I think you're the same as me, I, I like diversity, I don't like doing the same thing all the time, I like to be doing different things and meeting different people and having new experiences. So for me, my life is, you know, having as many new experiences as possible, whether that's through work or outside work, you know, whether that's hiking, running, traveling, uh, whatever, and also just trying to be, uh, just trying to be a good father. I'm really trying to own in on, on, on that and trying to be really good Around, around that kind of thing so for me going forward more challenges more new experiences and, and try to be a good dad awesome mate. well look, we're almost done uh, two questions that i always like to leave on um biggest lesson that you can take from your rugby career and transfer into everyday life i know we touched on a ton of them before but what's the biggest one that you could take from from the career i just think delivering on your word i think that's been the theme of this we started with this we talked through it and i think you know to be a successful rugby player you've got to deliver on your word to yourself in terms of your training but to your teammates as well and i think in life if you can deliver on your word to yourself and to your friends family work colleagues that'll take you a long way in life brilliant brilliant and and, and one more thing if you could go back to day one um, and do it all again, what would you do differently? Oh, that is a good question. <laughs> um, this could be another answer. Yeah, no, well, <laughs> day one, 
well, if I could do anything differently, I'd just say believe in yourself a little bit more than you did. You know, I still, I learned lessons around self-belief, but it's something I really had to manage during the first kind of seven, eight years of my career. And even at the start, my captain was, captain said, I'd just say, just believe in yourself, just that little bit more, a little bit more than you did. That's the only thing I'd say. Brilliant, mate. Well, look, I'm going to leave it there, mate. Like I say, super busy guy. I respect your time. And I really, really appreciate you coming on. Like, you're an absolute hero, man, watching you when you're at Rhinos and stuff. So, to have you sat here across from me, is, is, I'm absolutely buzzing with it, mate. Sure, so. I've loved it, mate. It's been brilliant. Thank awesome, you. buddy, right? Thank you so much, bro. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Ta, thank you. Thanks so much for listening. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. And if you need any more information on the Mansformation program, just hit the link below.